Do you ever lie awake at night and worry? Do you ever worry that maybe we'll run out of all the stuff we need to make things? Like one day the management from General Motors or Ford or Chrysler will call up all their workers with a robocall and say, um, don't come to work tomorrow. We ran out of steel. We're not going to be making cars. Any of you ever had that? No? Okay, I'm not surprised. Um, but other people do, and let me introduce you to a couple of them. Paul Ehrlich, you may have heard of, he is kind of famous for being a populationist. I think that's the word he actually uses. He worries about the growing population of the world and whether we can sustain the growth in population that we have. And back in 1980, he started saying things like, well, if the population keeps growing, how are we going to have enough stuff to meet all their needs? And he suggested that that would put huge pressure on the prices of all the commodities that people use. And he made a prediction that metal prices would go out of control within 10 years because of the booming population of the world. And of course, for every prognostication, there's somebody who's got a different view. And in this case, it was this guy, Julian Simon. Julian Simon is an economist. He worked at the University of Maryland, opposite coast from uh, Paul Ehrlich. So there's this coastal rivalry going on, I guess. And there's this um, kind of disciplinary rivalry between a populationist and an economist. And Julian Simon took the view that, no, don't worry about it. Technology will come to our rescue. He was the, the guy that first came up with this idea of what was then called the techno fix. Science will work it out for us. The engineers, the scientists will find a way to get what we need more cheaply, or if the, we really run out of stuff that we need, they'll find something else that will do just as well. Okay, who won? They made a bet. They actually made a bet in 1980. They bet $1,000 that, you know, Paul Ehrlich said prices will go up, and Julian Simon said prices will go down, and they checked the prices in 1980. And in 1990, they came back and they checked the prices again. Who won the bet? Anybody know? Simon won the bet. Yeah, you're very smart. Um, <laughs> I would, you know, I don't give out financial advice, but I would recommend not betting against economists. Um, <laughs> here is actually a little bit more of the history than um, you really needed. The little red bar there is the duration of the Ehrlich-Simon bet, and you can see that in 19, from 1980 to 1990, the metal prices did go down, but it was actually part of a long, an ongoing trend. You can see from 1845 all the way through 2010, thereabouts, the prices of metals have gone down. There have been a few blips. There's a, a distinct upward blip for the First World War. There's a distinct downward blip for the Great Depression. And there are lots of others that you can explain by historical circumstances. But the general trend is pretty much undeniable, except right there at the end. Look right at the right of, the, of this graph, and you can see that prices started climbing up again, oh, in about 2000. And Around 2000, we started to hear other interesting stories. Jet engine manufacturers were suddenly stressed and had to work around shortages of a metal called rhenium. Rhenium's very expensive, very essential for jet engines, and they just didn't have a secure supply for it. Then other things started happening. Um, we started to hear stories about other things running short, in particular, we've heard lately that, um, well, we have new technologies available to us for lights. There are um, new fluorescent tubes, which are twice as efficient as the ones that are installed in most buildings today. So your office buildings, the long four-foot fluorescent tubes. Um, the Department of Energy was going to mandate that we replace all the old ones, or stop selling the old ones and replace them all with the new ones. Just as much light for half as much electricity and the electric light manufacturers came back to the Department of Energy and said, no, we can't quite do that. The trouble is that the new ones require more of 
terbium and europium, two fairly obscure elements, and we can't find enough of it. So, sorry, that one's off the table. We'll have to delay that until we can find more terbium and europium. There's more things going on out there. Uh, wind turbines. We live in Iowa. It's a great state for wind energy. Uh, you drive around, you'll see wind farms. We generate 20% of our electricity with wind. Um, drive past a wind farm, you'll see all the wind turbines turning elegantly in the breeze. And if you look carefully, you'll usually see one or two wind turbines that aren't turning. Who knows what's wrong with those? Well, they're broken. Uh, it's not that complicated. Um, yeah. Uh, some of them are trick questions. Um, What's broken, though, is a gearbox. Usually, it's a gearbox. The gearbox is the weak link in the wind turbine technology. Um, gearboxes are just notoriously unreliable things, particularly these high-torque wind turb um, gearboxes and wind turbines. We know how to make wind turbines without gearboxes. We can make what's called a direct-drive wind turbine, but for that, you need especially strong magnets. And to make especially strong magnets, you need... Um, an alloy made of neodymium, iron, and boron. And iron and boron are relatively easy to get, but neodymium, and also a little bit of dysprosium that's thrown in there, there is no reliable source for those. They're called rare earth elements. And it's my job in this world, I'm now the director of the Critical Materials Institute, it's my job to worry about these materials that go critical, that, that are things you really, really need, but cannot always get. That's what I do. Um, looking in a little more detail at this latest blip, um, this is data from the World Bank, and you can see it's not just metals that are getting more expensive, but it's um, energy and agriculture or food. Everything that we use is getting more expensive starting in 2002. You can see the tail end of that declining curve starting around 2000 there. Um, okay, there's a big downward spike for the, uh, the recession of 2008, but things are inexorably climbing up in, in value again. What's causing it? Well, there has been a shift. That's the theme of the day, is shift. Um, what's happened is that Paul Ehrlich was sort of right. The world population is growing, but if the population grows by getting lots and lots more really, really poor people in the world who don't buy things. It doesn't put much pressure on commodities. But when people start getting rich, when they join the middle class, however you define that, and it's defined differently in different parts of the world, but when people start getting rich and they join the middle class and they start buying things, then you start to put pressure on with commodities. And what's happening is now, we're seeing a projection that um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development surely must be a credible organization with a name like that, um, <laughs> says that the middle class population of the world will grow from 1.8 billion in year 2012 to about 4.9 billion in 2030. It's going from less than a quarter of the world's population today to about two-thirds of the world's population in only, what, 17 years from now? That's a very fast growth. Um, and all of those people who become part of the middle class, they start to have a little bit of disposable income. What is the first thing they buy? Television? Oh, no, 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 no. There's no point buying a television in the middle of Africa because... No one's broadcasting anything. But they do buy cell phones. If you um, become middle class in Africa, cell phones the first thing you buy. It gives you access to all sorts of things. It gives you access to banks. Most banking in Africa is done through a cell phone. So I took a look at the cell phone. Oops. It's a periodic table. Um, there will not be a chemistry lesson. This is kindergarten chemistry. All you have to do is count the blocks. Um, this is, you know, it was actually the 40th anniversary of the first cell phone call just a few weeks ago. I don't know if you caught that in the news. Um, but the yellow blocks in that periodic table are all of the elements that you would have needed 
to make a cell phone like that one in the illustration. Um, actually, it's pretty much all of the elements you'd have needed to make a cell phone until about 10 years ago, maybe even less than that. Um, so, you know, there's that big phone, it weighed several pounds, and all of us today carry around you know, these little smartphones that weigh not many ounces. And my question to you is, which one uses more stuff? That one? Or the today's cell phone? Yeah, you're smart people. I should have remembered, I'm coming to a TED conference. Um, <laughs> so this is all of the elements that are used more or less, I think I got them all. It's hard to check anymore. Um, these are all the elements that are used in today's smartphones. And I, I left the ones in yellow that are uh, held over from an old-fashioned cell phone. All the new ones are in green. And the one in red is lead. That one has been removed. Uh, we got the lead out. And you can thank, <laughs> you can thank the Ames Lab in Ames, Iowa. Uh, who invented a lead-free solder. Thank you. Uh, that lead-free solder is in all cell phones made in the world today, uh, and it's there so that we don't have lead, so that you don't um, have to worry about lead leaching into the environment when you throw away your cell phone. By the way, please don't throw away your cell phone. Um, recycle it instead. It's much more um, good for the environment if you do that. Now, look at all those elements, and I think there's about 60, maybe 65 of them. Um, like I said, it's kindergarten chemistry, you only have to count. Uh, if you take away all the radioactive elements in the periodic table, we're using something well north of half, probably closer to two-thirds of all of the available elements that we might be able to use. Those are all of the elements that there are. We're using most of them. What does that mean? Well, it means two things. One is that when we try to recycle these phones, it's really complicated. If you want to recycle a cell phone today, a smartphone, to get back, say, the high-value components, the gold, there's a little bit of gold in every iPhone. If you want to recycle that, you have to separate it from 64 other elements. If you're recycling an older phone, you only have to separate from 30 elements. You don't need to know very much in detail about chemical separations, which is a difficult subject. You don't need to know very much to know that separating gold from 65 elements is harder than separating it from 30 elements. We're making things more difficult for ourselves. The other thing that's happening is we're making ourselves more vulnerable to shortages. With this phone, you've got roughly 65 elements that you have to find. If any one of them becomes a shortage material, that technology goes away. You can't make it anymore. When you only had, 30, you know, one in, uh, you only had a chance of 30 elements going into shortage, you're much more robust against shortfalls of any materials. So we're making ourselves both diffi more difficult to recycle and more vulnerable to shortages. This is a shift, okay? Um, the ingredients of the smartphone include a bunch of things called rare earth elements. There they are, um, uh, lined out for you in the periodic table. And let me show you what's happened to the price of rare earths, just so you get some feel for what a critical material might be. Um, this graph comes from Thomson Reuters, another reputable agency. Um, it shows the price of uh, a few of the rare earths, neodymium, dysprosium, cerium, uh, which is only three of the 17, versus gold and silver. If you'd invested in gold or silver back in 2004, then by about 2011, you would have made, what, uh, maybe six times your money, which is a pretty good investment. But if you had invested in dysprosium, you would have made 60 times your money. That's a nice investment, if you could realize it. There's no um, futures market in dysprosium, by the way. You can't <laughs> actually. You actually have to buy buckets of dysprosium, store them in your garage. It's not easy. Um, 
This is not the first time this sort of thing has happened. Uh, it actually happened also in 1978 to the price of cobalt. And I like to show people this one because you can see this big spike in the price of cobalt in 1978, but it's followed by massive price instability that has gone on since 1978 all the way through the present day. That makes it very unpleasant for a manufacturer to try to use cobalt. They don't know how much it's going to cost. That makes it very difficult to project a price for any item. What has happened to the rare earths and to cobalt is very simple. In both cases, we relied on one source, and that one source became unavailable. The rare earths, it was China. China stopped exporting rare earths to the rest of the world, or severely, it didn't stop, it severely restricted exports to the rest of the world, starting in about 2010. In 1978, it was a different story. It was cobalt. It was coming primarily from one place. It was Zaire. Zaire was a highly unstable state. It uh, had many revolutions. And the, one of the upshots of that was the cobalt supply to the rest of the world stopped. So where you have one source, very high risk. It's not the first time it's happened. Let me take you back a few more decades, well, a few more centuries. Um, I want to look at the Bronze Age. Copper replaced stone because copper was a better material than stone. Bronze replaced copper because cop um, bronze was better than copper. Iron was a terrible material. It didn't replace bronze. Iron, look, it corrodes. It's horrible. Um, it doesn't hold as sharp an edge as bronze. Um, it, we stopped using bronze, not because iron was better, but because Copper ran out. Bronze is an alloy, which is nerd talk for um, a mixture of copper and tin. Copper came from Cyprus. Tin came from sort of a place at the edge of civilization at the time, uh, barbarians, wild men in England. And um, the, the source of copper was what stopped. What was the response? The archaeological record shows that the ancients started recycling bronze. They looked for new sources for the copper, and in fact, the Egyptians were successful at finding a new source for copper. And then material substitution, they used iron instead of bronze. It took 200 years for iron to actually come to a point where it was good enough to work in place of bronze. In that 200 years, civilization collapsed, trade collapsed. Great civilizations like Sparta, Troy, the Mycenaeans, the Hittites vanished. What are we doing today with the rare earths? Guess what? We're doing recycling, source diversification, and material substitution. And that's what the Critical Materials Institute does. Doesn't take us 200 years anymore. It takes us about 20. We're shooting for two, and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you.